Recently I've been seized with a kind of spontaneous inspiration to talk a little bit about the books that I haven't got a chance to study. I'm sort of using this as a kind of outlet for all of my different varied thoughts and ideas and everything like that. Hopefully we can discuss some things together, learn a few things, and just genuinely have a good time. I had a lot of ideas to start off with when I was thinking about what I should do. I thought it would be sort of less a less weight on my mind if I was to start with something a little bit more casual. So it'll be fun to, I think, talk a little bit about just a kind of timeline on gothic tropes, how they emerged, how they've changed. Um, so this is designed for people who haven't really picked up a gothic book before or maybe have but haven't been quite sure what the deal was. Hopefully this sheds some light um, in terms of context, in terms of where these ideas came from, um, and the kinds of things that they're trying to achieve. So when we think of the gothic, we kind of think of the musical genre or, you know, a style of dress or something of that nature, which, you know, is um, definitely to be considered when we're talking about those kinds of things. And it's interesting to see how cultural trends have kind of emerged out of gothic notions and such. There was an architectural movement in the, uh, I would say, the late Middle Ages. You look at famous churches like the um, Papal Palace in Avignon, for example, sort of high arched windows, very awe-inspiring, and is basically designed to make you feel little, which is why um, Gothic architecture is used a lot in medieval churches and such, very much from a late medieval period before the Renaissance started to happen, and before the Protestant Reformation and everything like that, which comes into play very strongly when we start talking about gothic literature and the tropes it kind of relies on to create a similar sense of awe-inspiring dread or heavy kind of emotional response to terrible, terrible things that happen in these books. Essentially, what the gothic is trying to do, it's taking a very romanticist kind of point of view in the way that William Blake tries to kind of evoke all of these emotional responses in you through poetry and stuff by talking in very, you know, broad kind of overarching terms about the beauty of nature and the um, degradation and disgusting way that mankind, you know, completely and utterly annihilates it through their progression and industrialization. All of the toxic elements of society seek to kind of oppress what is so beautiful and utterly kind of devastating about nature in a way that we can't possibly hope to comprehend because it's something so much larger than just sort of one person's individual experience. It's trying to evoke this kind of pure emotional response out of them to make them power in a metaphorical corner, making the good aspects, the good characters, the heroes, you feel powerless and small in the sort of wake of the villainous aspects. They take many different forms, but that is essentially the kind of standard. The hero is constantly being oppressed by a force which is larger and more powerful than themselves, and they often have to outrun it to get to safety once again. Often they end happily, often they don't end quite so happily. When I go through my five novels, Today I am not going to be giving away the endings because um, I hope that after I talk a little bit about them you'll be inspired to go and read some of them. This movement sort of became popularised um, very much in England. All of the books I will be talking about today, all of them are English. In England there was a sort of very adverse reaction to everything that happened in the French Revolution because there was a lot of romanticism, um, there was a lot of brutality, a lot of murder, a lot of people parading around the streets of Paris with the heads of monarchal figures on pikes. From the English perspective, a nation, a society that was in the process of industrializing and very much caught up in notions of sensibility, all of these things happening in France uh, seem to be completely and utterly barbaric, medieval and dark and regressive in a lot of ways to the English mindset. It becomes a point of inspiration for all of these novels, these gothic novels, to sort of emerge in the spirit of fictionalizing the sense of revolutionary horror that emerged from the French Revolution in the mindset of the English. I was a bit torn on which novel to talk about as a starting point for the gothic. Like, the obvious answer to me is not The Monk by M.G. Lewis, but Horace Walpole's The Castle of Otranto. Inevitably I chose The Monk instead, just because a lot of the themes that are in Walpole, even though Walpole came first, he published in 1764, whereas, you know, The Monk is 30 years after that, almost, 1796. I think Walpole kind of walked so Matthew Lewis could run in a lot of ways. Um, they do discuss very similar themes and are set in kind of very similar landscapes and have very similar 
kind of cut and dry premises, the heroines are both very similar as well. If you're looking for a place to start to get this kind of primitive gothic experience, Matthew Lewis the Monk is where it's at, in my opinion. It's about a monk called Brother Ambrosio. Um, he has quite a lot of status with all of the other brothers and the nuns as well. He catches the eye of a young sort of 16 year old virginal girl called um, Antonia, who makes him feel all of these all of these thoughts that he shouldn't be thinking as a monk. He sort of, at the start, tries to pray these things away and is, uh, throughout the process of the story, kind of coerced into going after her by another monk at his monastery, who actually turns out um, to be a woman named Matilda. This sort of red-headed, beautiful woman who introduces him to all of this magic to get Antonia by any means necessary. Antonia being this kind of blonde, fair, perfect in every way, um, virginal heroine who doesn't know what's coming to her. She she thinks very highly of Ambrosio like the rest of the people in town. I don't want to spoil anything about what happens, but that's sort of the main premise. There are a lot of side plots in this book as well. Delving into the kind of barbaric, uh, torturous scenes of the Spanish Inquisition. Now, an important thing to note about this one is, of course, the setting. The Mediterranean setting is very important and becomes a very much a staple of the gothic, essentially, especially in this early time. These English authors are very much drawn to warm, summery, medieval Catholic countries. All of these English Protestants are talking about medieval worlds, these Catholic medieval worlds as being very much other to the kind of enlightened, industrializing British society at the time, wherein Catholicism is kind of synonymous with life before the Protestant Reformation. Another very important thing that I want to talk about in regards to the monk is the supernatural element being the catalyst for horror. Matthew Lewis relies very heavily on spiritual ideas of religion, the devil, Satan, and witchcraft alchemy, magic, everything like that, to authenticate the evil of Ambrosio, particularly the evil of Matilda, who tempts him both sexually and spiritually. Lewis relies very heavily on the supernatural to create the grotesque horror and fear that the gothic is after. Essentially we call that gothic horror. In The Monk, you've got witchcraft. Satan even makes an appearance at some point. Another thing about The Monk, which always shocks people a great deal when they first read it, is just how violent it is. The scenes do described here, the violent ones are extraordinarily explicit, they don't hold anything back. A bit of a difficult pill to swallow in some cases. That is my first recommendation, The Monk, as a sort of gateway into understanding what the gothic was when it was first popularised in the uh, English literary scene, I suppose. Next I'd like to talk about Anne Radcliffe's The Italian. Now, Anne Radcliffe is a kind of household name when it comes to the Gothic. If you think about Gothic fiction and Gothic, gothic literature, she's going to be the one who appears probably first on your list of be all and end all gothic authors and such. She does a really good job of waxing poetic about the landscape since combining the sense of that gothic grotesque element of the sublime with the romanticist beauty of nature. How it makes us feel small in comparison but how that is also kind of a nice thing. It is a really good response to Lewis's The Monk. The main villain is again a priest. It's set in Italy instead rather than Spain, but it's still that medieval Catholic environment, same time period. The premise of this one essentially is there is Father Shadoni who has decided that he likes Eleanor, who is a kind of middling class girl. So he enlists the help of a Marquesa um, of Vivaldi to destroy her and bring her to him. So Radcliffe in this one has sort of taken the tropes or archetypes that Lewis Lewis plays around with in his novel and kind of toys with them, plays around with them, changes them slightly, a little bit in some cases. Um, for instance, Eleanor isn't as virtuous as Antonia. Eleanor's a little bit more pragmatic. She hasn't got as much money as what Antonia does. She has more, more of an active perspective in the novel as opposed to Antonia who is just sort of there as a symbol. Eleanor is given a little bit more autonomy and we love her for that. 
In The Monk, the threat is entirely supernatural in origin. In Radcliffe, in general, not just in The Italian, but in pretty much all of her novels, she relies not at all on the element of the supernatural. She relies on very real world human level threats. You know, the joint threat of the Marchesa and Shadoni, who together have quite a lot of political and spiritual power, as well as Shadoni being the large, overpowering, physically, man that he is. So it's this interplay between the villain having both power and status over the hero and heroine, and they, from their submissive positions, have to fight back against these large, foreboding, powerful evils that hold both power and status above them. It's very similar in The Monk, actually, when you think about the relationship between Antonio and Ambrosio, wherein and Ambrosio is a kind of spiritual leader um, in the town where the where the novel is set. Um, Ambrosio has physical power, supernatural power, he has spiritual power, he has political power, all of these things, all of this status over her. And so it's very similar in this way and this is something that also very much defines the early gothic as well, is that the villains also always have both power and status and this is something that the heroes inevitably lack in comparison to them. It's a lot less overtly violent than Lewis's novel as well, so if you're wanting something that's a little bit less slap bang in your face, I would absolutely recommend The Italian. This one is a lot more digestible in that the violence isn't quite so explicit as in the previous one. Now, we call this realistic gothic as opposed to the supernatural gothic of um, Lewis. We call this gothic terror instead of gothic horror. Terror of the human condition and all of the societal, cultural nuances which make being a human so terrifying and represents very nicely the other side of the gothic in this early period, the horror and the terror. I'd love to know which one everybody prefers the idea of. Do you prefer horror movies that rely very heavily on supernatural aspects to create this kind of horror element? Or do you prefer ones that rely on humans and humans doing terrible, horrible things and power dynamics and hierarchies, abuses of power, temptation in a very human sense? In early gothic novels, I always tended to prefer the supernatural ones, but thematically, I always find terror to be more interesting than horror just because it's more immediately relatable to think of humans as being sort of inherently awful beings because they often are as opposed to making that kind of leap to thinking about things supernaturally back in the 1790s when these were being written religion and spirituality and god and christianity in general were a lot more tangible you know now we tend to be a lot more secular about these types of things and so the horrible gothic aspect that it tries to make you feel is easier to come by when we're talking about terror when we're talking about reality now i think This is a very interesting one to read, especially after you've read The Monk and The Italian. Going on to Northanger Abbey after this is, if you're really thinking about the themes of the gothic and the way that these novels sort of shape up and the, the character archetypes which occur again and again, that of the kind of virtuous heroine, that of the gallant hero, the villain with both status and power. This is a very, very interesting satire where Jane Austen simultaneously critiques and sends up these these caricatures and tropes and thematics and archetypes and things but at the same time really advocates for the novel and the gothic because you know at this time they are very much seen as silly books to be read by teenage girls and they don't inform you about anything remotely logical or practical for life. They're just sort of highfalutin, meaningless dribble that girls read. Austen even sort of breaks into the first person during this novel and advocates for novel reading in general and how important it is to understanding life and connecting with things on an emotional level, which, you know, when push comes to shove is really what the gothic is all about. Uh, we have Catherine Morland, the main character, who is going to Bath, England for her sort of societal debut. She's staying with some friends of her family, goes to a bunch of balls, meets a dashing lad called Henry Tilney who is quite rich. Halfway through the novel she goes with him and his sister Eleanor 
and stays in his very gothic mansion, a place called Northanger Abbey, where she sort of expects all of these bad, terrible, awful gothic things to happen. But of course none of them do because it's not a novel, it's real life. And she sort of goes from looking at the world like it is a novel or a storybook to understanding things for what they really are by the end. So when she comes to Bath, the first friend that she sort of makes there is a, a girl called Isabella Thorpe. Isabella immediately sort of introduces her to all of these, you know, gothic novels. Um, she's in the process of reading Anne Radcliffe while she's there. Um, the Italian is mentioned, um, The Monk by Lewis is also mentioned in the novel, so it's very much sort of involved in this discourse of the gothic going on at the time. Catherine essentially fashions herself as a gothic heroine of her own story, essentially, which she very much is, and which um, Austen very ironically makes reference to at the very, very beginning of the novel, calling Catherine out a little bit for not appearing like your sort of typical gothic heroine in the fact that she's kind of unpretty, not rich, doesn't spontaneously know how to play the piano or anything like that, as all gothic heroines up until this point sort of tend to be able to do. Catherine is a little bit more, a little bit more ordinary than your usual gothic heroine. The book is also filled with binaries, direct discrepancies made between the kind of neoclassical environment of Bath, with its kind of Romanesque spas and bathhouses, with the Gothic manor um, of Northanger Abbey where the Tilneys live. It's kind of interesting when you think about Catherine's progress throughout sort of understanding of reality in the in the novel as well, where when she's in this neoclassical element, she is very much in storybook land. She thinks her life is a storybook. She's unable to perceive reality for what it really is. Uh, and then when she goes to the Abbey, she slowly accepts an understanding of reality. Her experience is backflipped with the architectural and environmental surroundings that she's associated with, um, which is super duper interesting and really nicely chops the novel in half between her time in Bath and her time at the Abbey. Um, it's even in two volumes to kind of reflect this as well. Another interesting thing is that this is actually set in England. Very much a choice by Austen to show the prevalence of the Gothic and also the un-Gothic in English sort of society, architecture and surroundings and such like this. And how very Gothic things actually are capable of happening in places that we do not necessarily associate with the Gothic. I normally don't really like Austen. Actually, that's a stretch. I just find her very difficult to read because the marriage plots for me, this sort of early archaic literary realism that we get from her, is not really something I enjoy too much in a genre sense, but the amount of nuance and irony that she puts into all of her works, especially this one, if we are talking about the gothic canon, is absolutely incredible. I love satire, I'm always down for it. And you know, to enjoy satire properly, you have to know the context of what, you know, the satire is satirizing. With that in mind, I think Northanger is an absolute hoot and probably, actually, definitely my favorite of Austen's novels. which leads me to Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, which is absolutely wonderful. You know, the sort of predecessor to science fiction and a very, very interesting marriage of the Gothic and the sort of more sublime, poetic romanticism that we spoke about before. Frankenstein itself is set in Switzerland mostly, which isn't very Mediterranean, but we're talking about Lake Geneva sort of with Mont Blanc in the background, um, a very, very sublime, beautiful uh, environment which is referred to throughout the novel constantly. The um, beauty of the landscape is paramount to this novel and you'll see it very easily in the sort of way that she continually describes um, the way that everything looks. I believe she wrote this when she was in Como in Italy, um, so surrounded by all of those kinds of landscapes that have become sort of synonymous with the Gothic. It needs to be beautiful for bad things to happen. <laughs> because it's doing that to toy with our emotional response, right? Everything that happens in the Gothic is larger than life. Um, whether it be supernatural villains, whether it be these powerful political or spiritual figures, or, you know, the landscape around us with tumbling avalanches, winds, 
scorching hot summers, things that sort of play into the extremes of life and human existence, things that we don't have any semblance of control over. The fact that we don't, that we're powerless to all of this stuff is what creates this sort of emotional high that the Gothic is really trying to tap into. A really interesting thing about Frankenstein is, as I said, it's a predecessor to science fiction in general, in that it and science fiction as an extension bridges that gap between gothic horror and gothic terror that we talked about before. It takes a thing that isn't real, an imagined concept, like in this case creating a, a monster out of discarded human parts. It's it's not a concept that exists, it's not something that has been done in the past, or at least to our knowledge, not successfully, that's for sure. That's where the sort of element of the supernatural comes in, but it is explained in a way that is sound in the fact that it is scientifically viable. We can picture it being done. Magic and alchemy is sort of way out there for us. In this case, stitching somebody together through scientific means that have been tried and tested, doing something new and, and not possible through means and methods tried and tested as possible is what science fiction is, or at least what it was when it was first conceived, which is what creates the horror in this case. It's because it's out of reality, but it's far too close to make us feel at all comfortable. In Frankenstein, there's also ambiguity as to who we see as the villain. Obviously, the monster is classified as a monster because he is sort of this grotesque figure who is ugly and huge and has the power in this situation, but none of the status. So it's hard for us to envision him as a gothic villain. If the monster has the power, then Victor Frankenstein, of course, has the status. So they both have heroic and villainous aspects. The monster itself is grotesque and commits a lot of murder and causes the death of those who very much don't deserve it because he is trying to sort of achieve peace and life and autonomy for himself and such. But on the other side of the spectrum, we've got Victor, who is very much playing God and creating this this uh, this monster in his own image and um, sort of denying it its right to reproduce and all of that kind of thing, which is the only thing that it wants. We can see a stripping down here of the gothic hero and the gothic villain, wherein Victor and the monster play both at once, simultaneously, against each other, with none of them being wholly good or wholly evil. It's a lot more convoluted in this one. It uses exactly the same parameters and tropes, but just shares them across both characters, rather than giving all of the heroic things to the hero and all of the villainous ones to the villain. It's ambiguous here, because because we don't know who the hero or the villain is. Basically, this shows a rise in interest of science in the Gothic and how they come to sort of combine to create a joint experience in that science can indeed inform the Gothic and the Gothic can indeed question science and birthed science fiction as a genre wherein gothic tropes are played with and brought into scientifically viable or interesting situations to be explored in new contexts. I think of Star Wars for example, very typical hero's journey type of stuff, explored through the realms of far-reaching galaxies and space and we've sort of become very desensitized to these ideas now but if you sort of strip it back and think about it for what it is, this is a sort of limitless expanse of, of mass and place and space and time and everything like that. You've got kind of these huge experiences that are completely unfathomable to us that are explored through science fiction. And that's sort of what the Gothic is touching on and what it is fundamentally. These ideas that make us feel small, insignificant and afraid are explored through this genre. Bram Stoker's Dracula is certainly not the first vampire novel to ever have existed. Polidori's The Vampire is probably the first major one. Lefanu's Camilla is also a very famous one that came before Stoker. 
But with Dracula, um, he's definitely tyrannical in the gothic horror sense. The sense of the supernatural is there, um, so we're drawing back on, you know, that Matthew Lewis idea of gothic horror, of the supernatural informing what is terrible about this. But there is also some sort of underlying subplots here which give the implications of this Transylvanian vampire man an extra sort of level of significance. And that's the sort of post-colonial aspect in that he is from far, far east in Romania where things are actually very much still largely medieval and underdeveloped, especially as opposed to places like Britain in Western Europe and everything like that, um, where people still live largely in agricultural societies rather than in urban centers like in Britain. Everything is still very medieval and reminiscent of the Dark Ages and all of those things that the gothic has, you know, historically with Radcliffe and Lewis tried to kind of emulate and represent as being other and dark and dreary and horrible and evil and barbaric and violent and all of that. When Dracula comes from this society to London, um, 1890s London, he brings with him the sort of insidious, archaic, lifestyle that he, you know, sort of lived and breathed, well, breathed is subjective, but lived, unlived back home. And he starts going after both men and women, turning them into his multiple wives, keeping them locked up um, sort of below his ruined abbey that he's living in and such. Um, the first wife he goes after is Jonathan, so it sort of paints a picture of foreign people and cultures and foreign influence more generally as being lecherous and insidious in the most fundamental sense as Dracula literally drains the life force from this civilized society and imprisons it um, sort of in his own domain. Yes, and he doesn't discriminate based on gender or anything. He'll take a wife that is a female or a wife that is a male. Because Bram Stoker um, was writing for a British audience and he was Irish, um, he sort of felt the desire to make sure that he was received in the context of the British canon rather than him being seen as an Irish writer. This is coming off the back of Oscar Wilde's recent imprisonment based on the fact that he was homosexual and so Stoker was extraordinarily eager to distance himself from all of the implications of Wilde who was another Irish author and paint himself up as being British and sensible and of British sensibilities. There was a, a massive backlash against Ireland and the Irish after what came out about Oscar Wilde at the time. Dracula being bisexual and going after, actively going after both men and women in the lecherous way that he does. Power dynamics he establishes between himself and the good, you know, hard-working people of Britain. As the gothic villain that he is basically paints Stoker's kind of narrative, the moral of the story he's writing as being fundamentally British and British focused and patriotic to Britain in the way that it's written and ends up with, you know, this sort of circle of respectable British men, including Jonathan, who has been, you know, violated by Dracula, a Dutch professor also of Western Europe, this is Van Helsing I'm talking about, and a bunch of other English men of various economic stations and positions all coming together to fight this foreign power that's leeching off their people. Extraordinarily interesting and poignant and has a lot of place in the interesting historical context surrounding this. And the, and the kind of homophobic panic that is informing and influencing the way that Stoker wants to be perceived. Mina, Harker, um, Jonathan's eventual wife um, is far more active than your kind of Antonia's or Catherine Morland's of the sort of early gothic narrative, even the Elizabeth Lavenzas of uh, Frankenstein. She is a working woman, she understands London City extraordinarily well, she knows how to use modern technology, she is proficient in writing shorthand, which the book is very adamant on reminding us every chapter it feels like. It's interesting sort of to see the progression of this idea of science coming into play again and it is sort of the culmination of the circle of lights or you know all of the vampire hunters um so arthur jonathan um mr seward and of course van helsing coming together all of these learned men who 
have active roles in society as professionals. They all have a profession. They're all working men in some capacity. Coming together to fight this sort of ancient evil with all of their modern tendencies. And of course, Van Helsing is a professor. Dracula, in a sense, reverts back to the original idea of the gothic horror villain in that he has both physical power and supernatural power and quite a lot of influence as well even though he's sort of stripped of his influence when he comes to Britain because he doesn't have any stakehold in the place but still very much has that sort of massive noticeable edge over um, the rest of the characters. However, it certainly does embrace the use of technology to be able to sort of confront this enemy and such, and advocates for the idea that all of these foreign othering threats can be defeated with modern sensible ideas and such. And so it relates the old archaic versions of the Gothic that we talked about with Lewis and Radcliffe to the kind of new ideas which are forming British society at this time to create a kind of amalgamation of all of the genres and progress it forward into the future where some of the tropes are utilized and some of them are simply changed to account for the contemporary audience and the way that the gothic itself has shifted over time. So that's it, my five gothic novels that I think are really good reads and essentially make up a good gateway into engaging with the gothic and understanding its roots, where it came from, and seeing how it's progressed. Which sort of brings up the idea of modern gothic. I didn't talk about anything from the 20th or 21st centuries. Obviously things have changed so much and there is so much more content being created that sort of fit into some of the molds I've spoken about. The thing that comes most to mind are things like the American campus novels, so things like Kill Your Darlings or Donna Tartt's The Secret History. Essentially, subgenres aren't as cut and dry as they were back then. You know, it was either gothic horror or gothic terror, but in this sort of process of time passing and the way we look at those subgenres, they, they sort of, they do exist, but they've just manifested and changed and warped together sometimes and been disregarded and put onto other things and played around with in so many different ways that we have so many more things to look at within those scopes and the way that they're used and stuff. Creating more subgenres and more kind of ways of looking at the gothic where we're still feeling fear and the grotesque all of that dread that is fundamentally associated with gothic if you take that element out of the gothic it ceases to be the gothic but we still very much get that with all of this media and art that we are consuming but it's just changed so much from what it was before so yes those were five gothic novels that i highly recommend if you're interested in delving into the genre for the first time or if you're just interested in broadening your scope and going back in time and seeing where it all began. I hope you enjoyed, I hope you learned something, and I hope you're inspired to do some reading. Um, that's the main thing that I want to get out of this. If you enjoyed watching today, please uh, consider giving this video a thumbs up or um, subscribing um, as I'll be posting more of these little tidbits, videos, and thoughts and rambling ideas as uh, more of them pop into my head. Let me know in the comments which one of those five books uh, have interested you the most, which one you're the most eager to read, if any, or if you have read them, which one is your favourite, which one is your least favourite. Do you agree with my five choices for good gateway gothic books, or do you think that they're absolutely crappy opinions and there are five better ones that you would recommend instead? I'd be interested to hear your thoughts. If you thought that any of my ideas or points were absolute hogwash, please feel free to let me know. I'm always happy to stand corrected about these types of things, as I don't generally know all that much. Again, thank you everybody so much for watching and I will see you next time.